Good evening, my name is Zain Alameen. Um, uh, I was told, I was asked to read an opening poem, so this will serve like a prayer, like an invocation, uh, an anti-imperialist invocation. Um, in, in the year 2006, uh, Lebanon was invaded by Israel. The war was supposed to last for three days, it lasted for 33 days. It was uh, co-funded and uh, supported and fueled by the United States. Uh, Thousands of uh, innocent Lebanese died in the process, but more monstrous than this and the moral obscenity that, that they committed, uh, as, as Kerry would say, is that they left uh, what's called cluster bombs. Uh, they left, uh, to be exact, one to two million cluster bombs. Does anybody know what cluster bombs are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cluster bombs are, have these ribbons and children are attracted to them and they they're not like mines you don't have to step on them. you just have to tell them and they'll explode and they left them all over Lebanon just to give you an idea about who we we're asking to intervene in Syria for humanitarian um, uh, purposes and I say this because the cluster bombs were manufactured in a factory in Rockville Maryland so um, this is called cluster and it starts with a quote from the head of the uh, Israeli Defense Force rocket unit uh, in July 2006, and I quote him, said, what we did was insane and monstrous. On his last evening, Abu Ali walked home between the rows of pines that lined his driveway, settled in the shelter of his great arbor, rolled a cigarette, was served tea by his wife, was preparing, was preparing for the expected arrival of unexpected guests. He spotted a cluster above his head and tugged at it. The stem snapped. The concealed cylinder slipped. Its yellow ribbon followed, fluttered down like a ticker tape. A dull pop was heard. A flash lit up the harbor. Abu Ali's last dispatch to Marjorie's children. All throughout that month that followed the summer rain, he had gathered the kids wherever he found them showed them pictures of all the colors that they come in. One next to a cell phone to give them a sense of scale. One of a boy sitting in a hospital, seeming to kneel, seeming to pray. He held his lectures under the cover of one tree or another, under the fig trees with their fruits in August 1st, in red August 1st, or under the sparse shelter of a fruitless pomegranate. The, the people of Marjayun say that on his last day he was seen near the cemetery sitting in the sprawling shade of the twisted branches of an olive tree. Thank you. Thank you. 
actions together. Um, so, so folks want to clarify and understand different arguments that folks have on different sides of it. And um, some because they're still in the process of figuring out their their own stance. Um, really, we want to share information, have a space available for questions, um, and for those of us who feel compelled to try and find actions together. Um, so, I really hope that we are all respectful to those differences in the groups and um, really appreciate where everyone's coming. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our two speakers and let them go on. First we're going to hear from Rania Masri, who is a human rights advocate and environmental scientist and professor at the University of Balaban in Lebanon. Um, she has served as coordinator of the Iraq Action Coalition on the Board of Peace Action and acts as the Arab Women's Solidarity Association's representative to the UN and, that's not that, as the director of the Southern Peace Research and Education Center at the Southern Studies in North Carolina. Uh, next we have Hassan Haddad. Um, he's the director of the Middle East Studies program at George Mason, uh, the co-founder and editor of Jala Jalaliya, uh, Ezine Online, as a big, massive leadership, and co-producer and director of the documentary film about Baghdad, um, about Iraq after the US invasion, and in case that's not enough, is also the executive director of the Arab Studies Institute. Uh, we're so honored to have you both here, and um, they're both going to talk for about 20 minutes, and I'll give you a little flag if um, we get down to five minutes or so. So, um, yeah, please. Um, I'd love to say it's, it's good to be here, but in all honesty, it's not that good to be here, because I'd much rather be here talking about any other issue rather than the further destruction of another Arab country by the United States. Mm -hmm. with 
revolution, to which the Syrian government responded with blatant repression, and consequently we, the people of conscience, particularly we, the people who believe in revolution, have no choice but to side with revolutionary forces. This is the framing. And I think it becomes vital that we examine this framing, deconstruct it step by step, and decide if this is a framing that we feel comfortable with, if this is a framing that's credible, that's historic, that's accurate, that's contextualized, and if not, what is a more accurate, proper framing for the horror and the carnage that has taken place in Syria for almost three years now? So one, we do have a moral outrage. Most definitely, every one of us needs to be morally outraged. Though I have difficulty to share moral outrage with members of the U.S. administration. There's something about that that feels uncomfortable to me. That to find members of Congress and you know, war leaders argue moral outrage because of the use of chemical weapons when this administration and administrations before it have not only endorsed and funded and supported the use of chemical weapons, but have themselves used chemical weapons, sure. not just in Japan and Puerto Rico and Vietnam and Laos, but in Iraq. And the toxic legacy of white phosphorus that was used in Fallujah, as recorded by the United States Army, is a toxic legacy that exceeds the toxic legacy of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you can just understand this. So, yes, there is a moral outreach of chemical weapons. And possibly there has been an international precedence with the idea being that it hasn't been an ally of the United States that has potentially used chemical weapons this time. Maybe that's the international precedence. And I use potentially because as of yet there is no evidence as to who actually did the chemical weapons attack. I'm not saying that the Syrian government might not have done it. I'm simply stating that the UN weapons inspectors, when they were sent to Iraq, it sent to Syria. Maybe that's a Freudian story because there's a lot of stories. When the UN weapons inspectors were sent to Syria, they were sent with specific instructions not to investigate the who, only to investigate the what. And there are means by which the who can be investigated, by the way, because they can look into the chemical construct and the, um, cap the, 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 the kind of sophistication of the weaponry that was used to be able to determine if they were Syrian governmental chemical weapons or if they were rebel-based chemical weapons. But nevertheless, they were given strict instructions not to examine the who. What's interesting when we also examine the, the issue of chemical weapons is this is not the first time that President Obama has raised the red flag with regards to the Syrian regime being accused of using chemical weapons. If we remember back in June of this year, in early June, President Obama declared that there was a red line that was crossed. Because remember, he declared the red line last year. There was a red line that was crossed. The Syrian government has used chemical weapons, albeit he acknowledged that they've allegedly used chemical weapons against a small group of people and they caused a small number of fatalities. Nevertheless, the outrage that he managed to build up was enough to minimize the opposition in Congress to the U.S. government sending weapons to those that they consider to be moderate opposition forces in Syria. But if remember, he had said that earlier. And when we look at this claim right here, there, there's one glaring inconsistency of all the aspects of this allegation. And I don't want to go into the details of the dossier, but we can talk about that. I don't want to go into the details of the investigation itself. I just want to talk about one specific aspect, because I think it reveals a lot. President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry, and en route, all the mainstream media that somehow love, love to promote war, they've all been raising the number of 1,400 fatalities. 1,400 people were killed in the chemical weapons attack in Wulta in Syria. And I find this number to be very interesting because the pro-opposition Syrian Human Rights Observatory, which has been the main source for numbers of fatalities in Syria, came up with a distinctly different number. And their number is 505. So we're not talking about a difference of a few hundred, we're talking about a difference of almost a thousand. And again, it, it, it just raises questions. There's also been this discussion that a red line was crossed. And Secretary of State John Kerry has said time and time again that there is a chemical weapons convention 
And so we've had the breaking of international law and setting aside the fact that if one government breaks international law, that does not allow another government to break international law in the process, which any act against Syria without UN Security Council resolutions approval would be a violation of international law. But even setting that aside, the use of the Chemical Weapons Convention as the quote red line is completely false because the Chemical Weapons Convention talks about prosecution and not bombardment. But still, we are morally outraged over the use of chemical weapons. What to do about it? If I listen to our own military, and it's rare that I actually quote military sources, but our own military in numerous statements have stated that militarily speaking, the military cannot be a fully effective use not only to deter chemical weapons usage in Syria, but to secure chemical weapons. And already, we have been hearing, already this past week, that the Syrian government has moved them. The Syrian government has moved them. And here, I cannot help but think of Iraq, because we were told the same thing for years. They kept moving those weapons of mass destruction. They kept moving them. And so it became incumbent upon the Iraqi government to prove that they don't have something prove a negative, which is impossible to prove, rather than the weapons inspectors being sent to Iraq to prove the positive. And I find ourselves, we're already getting into that language because, my God, the Syrian government is already accused of moving them. Okay. So if they could move them, I'm going to take our government at face value. Okay. Let's say the Syrian government is guilty of everything our government claims. The military then cannot be a method to secure and deter chemical weapons. It simply cannot work militarily. And we're not even adding another element to the issue of chemical weapons, which is that according to some United Nations sources, and I say this vaguely because the United Nations has not confirmed this, the United Nations, one United Nations representative has simply raised this as what I have strong suspicions that. But there is strong suspicion that certain armed elements within Syria of these opposition forces either already have or plan to have access of sarin gas and potentially other chemical weapons. So again, if the objective is no to chemical weapons, then it cannot, militarily speaking, let aside ethics and pragmatics and credibility and all legitimacy and all that, but militarily speaking, the military cannot be used as a secure element to deter chemical weapons, particularly when we don't know who has used them, who has access to them, and how they can be used. It simply becomes an impossible objective to be met militarily. Again, according to our own military. Then we're looking at the number of 100,000 fatalities, and there's simply one thing that really upsets me about this, particularly when the Guardian says that it is the Syrian regime that has killed 100,000 people. And I find that to be very odd, because according to the pro-opposition Syrian Human Rights Observatory, 43% of the 100,000 fatalities are actually Syrian army combatants. And it makes no logical sense for the Syrian government to actually kill members of its own army when it is fighting for its own survival. So let's just understand that 43% of the Syrian army combatants that have been reported as killed by the pro-opposition forces were, with a very high degree of confidence, killed by the rebels and not committed suicide or killed by friendly fire. So within that 100,000 fatalities, we need to understand almost half of them have been the Syrian army, so the Syrian government cannot be held responsible for those kinds of and again, when I find myself saying this, I can hear comments already that, oh my God, she's defending Bashar al-Assad. And just like I was accused of defending Saddam Hussein back during the Iraq sanctions, because we oppose the sanctions and we oppose the invasion and we oppose the occupation, and given the current binary that's being forced upon us in this country, if you oppose the bombing of Syria, if you say no to the bombing of Syria, thereby, ergo, automatically, you become a defender of the Syrian regime. And that's simply false flat. That binary, we have to reject it completely. We reject it completely. So when we look at this bombing campaign, and no matter how much Secretary of State continues to say it's not a war, I believe it would be as limited as the Pearl Harbor attack. If we remember, the Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. attack was quite mm -hmm. limited. It was just what's right. What were the direct military consequences? I'm not saying that we're going to face similar consequences. But according to the resolution that has just passed, and that now will be discussed in Congress, 
what is being discussed against Syria is a 60 to 90 day bombing campaign that is in no way limited or narrow. And at the end of the 90 days, there may be possibility for renewal and further discussion. So we're dealing with an open-ended resolution with no sunset, with an extraordinarily threat of possibly resulting in a regional war, with no guaranteed objectives that can be met, with a guarantee that it would destroy any possibility for a political settlement at a time when, and this is what it really gets absurd, Secretary of State John Kerry, Secretary of Defense Hagel, both have gone on record several times as saying, and I'm quoting here, there can be no military solution in Syria. These are their statements. <laughs> Secretary of State Hagel even went so far yesterday as to say that even after the bombing, even after we do everything, quote, quote, what is needed is a diplomatic settlement. <laughs> so, if they recognize that what is needed is diplomacy, why don't we just do it? Why to start a trap that will make diplomacy all the more difficult? Unless, what they're arguing now is the issue is not chemical weapons, the issue is regime change and altering the warring battlefield itself so we can empower other factors and weaken certain factors. Which then leads to the question of who would actually be empowered. We keep hearing word about this moderate opposition. And I would love Secretary of State John Kerry to actually show me who are these moderate armed opposition that he continues to speak of. Because in my book, it's not only important who you are and what you represent, but who you happen to fight alongside. And no matter how much these certain elements of armed opposition claim to be moderate, they are fighting alongside elements that are extremist. And when one representative asked Secretary of State John Kerry yesterday what he thought about a Nusra Front, which is recognized as a terrorist organization by the U.S. State Department and by the United Nations Security Council, what he thought of a Nusra Front operating in Syria, Kerry replied, and I quote, there are worse actors. Who? <laughs> so, there are worse armed elements than Al-Qaeda operating in Syria. And at the same time, the very administration that has gone on record as claiming, claiming that they are launching a so-called war of terror, war on terror, against Al-Qaeda in Yemen and Somalia and Pakistan, a drone war that has led to more than 4,000 fatalities, that on one side they want to kill Al-Qaeda suspected members, and on another side they want to train them and fund them and support their own. There has been not only a failure to discuss diplomacy, there has been a failure to recognize the need to have a full block of the arms trade. And here there is a strong possibility for the United States to act. There has been a failure to recognize the civil society in Syria that has been organizing for more than two years for a democratic representative government. And that all these elements actually weaken possibilities for a democratic representative honorable government in Syria. There has been a failure to clarify objectives. And there has also been a distinct failure and I would argue not only by the mainstream media, but also by us, the progressives, the leftists, the people that believe in a different framing, to recognize that this battle in Syria did not begin two and a half years ago. It's not that the United States suddenly recognized Syria two and a half years ago. Back since 1991, since 1991, regime change of Syria has been on the books in the United States. Back since 1991. In 2001, there was a classified plot that was revealed to U.S. Army General Wesley Clark that the U.S. plans to attack and destroy the governments of seven nations. Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, check, 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 Syria, Lebanon, Iran. So let, let's not try to fall within this framing that this is a new conflict that has arised. And let's also not fall within this framing of saying no to U.S. military intervention in Syria because then we are at least two years too late. The U.S. has already been militarily intervening in Syria since officially December 2012 when it began training the rebels, and JSOC has been operating in Syria since 2003. JSOC has been operating in Syria since 2003. And Syria has been on the books by several different administrations of wanting quote-unquote regime change. So what do we do about this? 
and I just want to end with just a few words as to where we can possibly go on this issue. In Syria, I think we need to be very, very strong that we're not only saying no to bombing, we're saying yes to a political settlement, we're saying yes to sincere negotiations, we're saying yes to the demands that the Syrians themselves have a role in deciding who rules Syria. In the United States, we need to be saying no to covert actions, no to JSOC, an end to presidential secrecy and yes to congressional oversight, a real public debate, and an end to this three trillion military industrial complex, this three trillion hammer that is constantly in search of a nail. And internationally, we need to be reframing the issue to make it clear that there can never, and there has not been such a thing as a humanitarian war or a humanitarian military intervention. Syrian civilians by bombing their country and eliminating the prospects 
non-military solution. If the will for such a political solution exists among nations like the United States and Russia, such crisis must be used to bring all parties to the table, to the table so that all may compromise, including the United States and Russia, on matters that have long harmed the region and its peoples. To